I'll call this meeting to order the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. Uh, this meeting is being live streamed. Members, in order for online attendees to hear, please make sure you unmute your microphone when speaking. Please identify yourself when making or seconding a motion so that we can uh, capture who that person was. And for those attending in person, please complete the sign in sheet located in the hallway before you leave. If you wish to make a public comment, please fill out the public comment card and return it to a staff member. For those participating via Zoom, Please keep your microphone muted unless you are called upon to speak. When appropriate on the agenda, we will request comments from those online. And you can indicate your desire to speak via the chat box. Staff is monitoring Zoom and will recognize you when it is your turn to speak. Aaron, would you please call the roll? Thank you. Mayor Bennett? Present. Frank Beal? Present. President Brawley? Mayor Grasso? Here. Uh, Mayor Hofert? Nina Itamudia? Present. Mayor Noak? President Reinbold? John Robertson, Mayor Rotering, Carolyn Schofield, Ann Sheehan, Matt Walsh, sure. Leanne Redden, yeah. and uh, Dr. Muhammad Madian. And we do have a new appointee for Cook County, uh, Mayor Jada Curry of Linwood. She's unable to join us today, but um, I'll call her name for the record. Mayor Curry. See you in September. We will see her in September. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we do have I think two people online, uh, Mayor Noak and Mayor Brawley. Are they on? I am, Mayor Noak. All right, the chair will recognize that two, we do have two people uh, uh, via Zoom, and I'll uh, entertain a motion that we allow them to participate in the meeting. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any questions? If not, all in favor, signify by a vote of aye. Aye. Those opposed, vote no. Motion carries. First item on the agenda. Uh, every year at this time, uh, I usually have an advice, and I usually I do appoint an advisory group to discuss the appointment of officers, including the chair, the officers, and the executive committee uh, for consideration at our September meeting going forward. Um, I'll ask Aaron, as I've done in the past, to uh, have a representative from Chicago, Suburban, and the counties to be part of that uh, committee to make the recommendations to the full board or to myself uh, in September. So, Aaron, if you would do that, I would appreciate it. I'll do. Uh, also, Aaron will be receiving the 2024 Walter Schreiber, Schreiber Leadership Award from the National Association of Regional Councils, that's NARC, which is a very prominent organization throughout the country. And it's, it's going to be being pre uh, presented at their annual conference later this month in Atlanta. Uh, the award recognizes significant impacts on executive director as has made at both the local, state, and national levels. The candidate must demonstrate professional and executive management excellence in carrying out regional concepts, approaches, and programs. Erin was nominated by her colleagues at CMAP, along with me, for the great work and leadership she's provided over her five years at the helm. Her peers at NARC, fellow leaders at regional councils across the country, ultimately selected her as a Schreiber Award recipient from a competitive list of candidates, which I heard was a pretty extensive so Aaron, on behalf of myself, the board of uh, uh, directors and all the staff at CMAP, um, congratulations on a very prestigious award, well-earned and well-deserved. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, so well, that was a surprise to me. So uh, thank you to our team for working this up and keeping it secret. We're and keep it a secret for about a couple of weeks. Anyway. So anyways, yeah, I'm just so honored and excited to accept this award later this month. Congratulations. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it to you. All right, so um, in my report here, I just wanted to welcome you all to our June meeting before we take a, a break here for the summer. Uh, as I announced earlier, Mayor Jada Curry from the village of Linwood will be joining us um, in September representing suburban Cook County. Uh, we look forward to um, having her join the conversation here at the regional level. I'm headed out to, to meet with her in early July uh, to on board her she just uh, her calendar just didn't time up for this meeting but she is excited about the opportunity and i think we'll bring a uh, great um, representation to to the work that we do here um, some recent engagements here may was pretty busy and productive i was able to uh, go to talk with a couple of our peers on both coasts about the work that we're doing here i participated in a panel with our our friends in southern california association of governments um, and also was joined by folks in uh, Miami and, and the Bay Area to talk about how important it is, our challenges that we're facing related to regional economic growth, but also to transit as well and what other MPOs are thinking about in terms of the solutions moving forward. You know, I, I think um, 
well, maybe it's some humbling isn't exactly the right word here. I'll say that it was humbling to hear that many of our regions are facing similar challenges, whether it's housing and lack of housing supply, whether it's how do we fund big things that we know are going to be so important for the people of our region um, and climate action planning for the region as well was a big theme that uh, we talked about at all of these uh, conferences that I've been at. And then I went to DC to talk to and be, I am on the board of the Americas for Gateways and Trade Corridors annual meeting. Again, I was reelected to board vice chair there. Uh, really the goal of that organization is making sure that uh, freight continues to receive a, uh, funding and a seat at the table on the national level. Um, this group does a lot of work around the freight investments fundings that have have come to fruition in the federal transportation bills. Um, the agency has always had a seat on the board there. So, and finally, at the end of the month, as a member of the High Speed Rail Commission here for the state of Illinois, I joined other members of that commission to talk about the creation of a statewide high speed rail network plan. We received an update on the proposed technical planning process that the state is going through right now, which will include developing a draft purpose and need, looking at market ridership for high speed rail across the state, alternatives analysis, service options, and operations analysis. Uh, and then, you know, I uh, also look forward to the summer because it's a time for me to get out and talk to the counties and our board members. So I was able to go out to McHenry County, uh, meet with the county board chair, with Carolyn, uh, with a few representative members who um, lead organizations across uh, the county, and just hear what's going on locally and understand what we as a regional agency might be doing, whether it's work related to housing or transportation planning here at the agency. So um, I hope you all enjoy your summer recess from the board and um, look forward to, to hearing from me because I am planning on getting out to as many places as I can to talk with you all individually. And then uh, finally, in terms of just updates from around the region here, we welcomed partners from across the region yesterday to our first steering committee member for our climate action plan for the region. I wanna thank Carolyn Schofield for joining as a representative of the board member to that group. Again, we've been charged by the US EPA to look at climate planning, really understand how we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions across a multitude of sectors, not just the transportation sector. And so we had to bring together sort of this cross um, cross sector group of folks. Uh, we had folks from US EPA, we had folks from almost every county there represented and really to just kick this off, understand what our goals and objectives of the planning process are. Uh, but there will be a series of working groups that get into building sector, industrial sector, energy sector to better understand what it is that we need to do as a region in terms of developing strategies and understanding what the, the opportunity is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions across these sectors now and into the future. Also included our friends at Northwest Indiana Regional Planning Commission. So uh, you'll be hearing more about this. Uh, they largely heard a presentation that you heard at your last board meeting or the board meeting before, just sort of grounding them and in, in the strategies and the goals and objectives that will be developed through this plan. Uh, legislative highlights. Uh, we will have a longer legislative update at the end of our meeting, but one item that I did want to highlight on the outset is that our Regional Planning Act Modernization Bill did pass both chambers and is at the governor's desk here. So uh, we are excited about that. Um, but I wanted to thank you all for your input, your collaboration, and, and the, res the ability that we had to get to sort of, I think, a, a place that will allow us to continue to do our business uh, throughout the year successfully. Also excited to announce, you'll see on screen here, our technical assistance awards that uh, you should have received a memo linked in your packet as well. We received about uh, 122 applications from 96 different applicants. So collaboratively through this joint call for projects with RTA, we evaluated the, the projects based on our staff expertise and capacity. And we'll be announcing here shortly uh, publicly that we are selecting 30 projects this year. Um, specific project types are listed on the screen here, but uh, we are excited about the cross section that we had apply. Of the 30 projects awarded, 11 of them will be with our cohort three and four communities, the communities that are in greatest need of support across our region. But all projects have strong transportation ties. Uh, five projects were awarded for the ADA self-evaluation um, planning and transition plans. And our first two projects for that will be piloting this work in Lamont and Montgomery. So we're excited to get to this point with our um, ADA transition planning work that we've been working hard to stand up over the past couple of years here. Um, okay, 
Sounds good. So uh, again, we'll be issuing a press release later this week that you'll receive. And then just one final note is that RTA will uh, review their applications and announce the, their awards um, in July is my understanding. But I want to thank each and every one of you for bringing these, helping us get the word about out about these projects. And again, as we continue to look for funding from the state for the agency, this is one way that I think we can tell the story of the valuable and invaluable work that our team does on behalf of the region in every day. I will recognize that uh, John Robertson arrived. And, and also we have, um, I think Mayor Brawley's online and we've already, uh, Mayor, we've, yes. already, we've already voted you in to attend the meeting, so. All right, so hold Thank on. you. Uh, sure. Oh, is it not on? You know what, if I could have somebody come look and see if the center screen, that would be great. Yeah. Thought, thought you were blind this morning. And Still one short. Okay, so uh, go ahead. Under the next, uh, it's on there. Okay, under the next, uh, actually two items, the minutes and the uh, various contracts and procurements. Uh, under consent agenda, we would present those, and it was a single vote. But fortunately, because we did change the uh, made changes to the bylaws, if we did not have a majority here to vote, a quorum to vote that both of these items could be taken up? We do have, actually, we, I think we do. We have Mayor Hopert online. Well, Mayor, Mayor Hopert, are you on? I'm here, yeah. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Well, then I can so, stop what I'm saying and uh, we'll, uh, I'll make a mo entertain a motion that we allow the mayor to come on online. Second. Moved and second. All those pairs signified by a vote of aye. Opposed, vote of no, and the motion carries. Mayor, welcome. Thank you. We now Thank have, you. Uh, Thank you. I have a quorum to vote on uh, uh, items uh, three one to uh, four point oh oh nine. Thank you. I will wait on the minutes. Uh, we can have the presentation then on the contracts. We have somebody doing so. That. So actually, because we've shifted to the consent agenda, oh, yeah. we don't actually have to do that. So Good evening. yes, yes. Thank you for that innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, for you are the minutes of uh, last uh, month's meeting, along with uh, procurements. Items 4.01 to 4.09. I'll entertain a motion to uh, accept uh, um, or, or to approve the minutes and accept the uh, procurements. So moved. No. Okay. Moved by Alderman Noak, seconded by uh, Mayor Grasso. Uh, call the roll on this, please. Let me get to my roll call here. Thank you. Um, Mayor Bennett? Aye. Ma Frank Beal? Yes. Mayor Brawley? Aye. Mayor Curry? Mayor Grasso? Aye. Mayor Hofert? Aye. Mayor Demudio? Aye. Mayor Noak? Aye. President Reinbold? John Robertson? Mayor Rotering? Carolyn Schofield? Ann Sheehan? Matt Walsh? Yes. And the motion carries. Thank you. And just as a quick reminder, because this is the first time that we've done a consent agenda here, that in future, uh, we can always remove these items if there are questions from the consent agenda. If you don't come from a municipality and you're used to doing that, uh, we certainly can uh, take those items off um, if there's questions. Okay. And, and I think just the protocol. Because I oh, if you could use your microphone for folks online. Thank you, Mayor. Um. Yeah, I think also protocol might be that we have to announce that if anybody's from the public that wanted anything off the consent agenda, the public would also to do that too. Uh, have a right to do that. I believe that's... Okay, we will go ahead and uh, check in with our lawyers. Give me a little speech that, that. that Jerry could make that just covers it all. Great. Thank you. Thank you. By right, moving on to uh, item... Regular agenda 5.0. So, so this first item here is just for information for you, the Memorandum of Understanding between the CMAP Board and the MPO Policy Committee. You'll see that in your packet there. This is something that we do every so often is bring this back to the bo both boards. So when CMAP was created, the intention was that we were thinking of collaboratively about land use and transportation planning and all of the intersections of the work that we do. And so this MOU has been a longstanding document of agreement between these two bodies about 
the different um, roles and responsibilities, but how the, there's a strong commitment to continue to work together. So I wanted to make sure that you saw it. Uh, if you have any questions about it or thoughts at this point, we are not recommending any changes. We do think it accurately reflects the organization and our commitments to work together. We will have it at tomorrow's MPO agenda as an informational item, and we will be asking for your affirmation of the MOU at the October joint meeting. We thought that would sort of be a nice sort of ceremonial um, ask for both bodies to do together. Okay. Yeah, right. questions? Any questions? All right, moving on to 502, and that's the Regional Transportation Plan update. Alex Balls and also Julie Reschke. Reschke. All right, thank you. Um, so my name is Alex Balls, he, him. I'm a senior research analyst with CMAP uh, in the RAP division, and I'm the project manager for the regional socioeconomic forecast. I'm also going to be joined by Carlos Lopez, uh, he, him, uh, senior policy, uh, senior analyst here at CMAP, and I'm the project manager for the local socioeconomic forecast. All right. Next slide. All right, so the reason that CMAP does a forecast is in part because it's a federal requirement. Uh, so every MPO has to create a forecast for transportation and land use conditions to at least a 20 year planning horizon. As many of you are aware, this current long range transportation plan will go to the year 2050. Uh, most MPOs have a generally similar process, although the details tend to differ um, about having a two part process. So the first part is a regional forecast that looks at demographic and economic trends in the region and tries to come up with you know, population totals for the region as a whole. And then second, a local forecast that looks more at the local trends, reflects current knowledge, policy considerations such as zoning and stakeholder input. Uh, it's important to note that the local forecast is controlled by the regional forecast. And what that means is the regional forecast provides the totals that are then allocated to the local level through the local forecast process. The focus of this presentation will be on the regional forecast, which we originally completed a draft of, uh, and the local forecast is still in the process of being developed. Next slide. So you're gonna get a broader update about the regional transportation plan after this, but I just wanted to kind of note some of the parts that the forecast plays in this regional transportation plan. Uh, it is used as part of the financial plan, trying to understand how many people and jobs in the region will help us understand how much money we have to invest in the region. Um, it's used in the scenario planning process. We work very closely with our travel modeling team, both in developing the forecast and in using the forecast to evaluate different transportation projects. And it's an important part of stakeholder engagement as we talk to people about where the region is headed. Next slide. So what do we forecast? So population change in an area is determined by three main factors, the number of people that are born, the number of people that die, and the number of people that move in and out of that area. And so the same is true for our region. We are forecasting kind of all three of these things independently, and you can add them up to get the total change for the region. Um, we are also projecting the number of jobs. And so the main outputs of the forecast will be the number of people, the number of households, and the number of jobs in the region. Next slide. So what data do we use to kind of create this forecast? Uh, some of the data we use is historical data, looking at birth rates and mortality rates. Uh, are, when we look at this, we're not looking at the COVID times because we know that there's some wonky data with that. Um, and trying to understand, you know, how our birth rate and mortality rate compares to the country as a whole. Um, and we also use projections by agencies that kind of specialize in doing this type of forecasting. So we purchase a jobs forecast from Moody's Analytics, an industry leader in this. Um, and that helps us drive not only the number of jobs in the region, but the expected migration into the region. Uh, we also use economic data provided by the Congressional Budget Office, things like unemployment rate and labor force participation rate to help determine kind of how the number of jobs might impact the number of people in the region. Uh, and lastly, we use demographic projections provided by the census on, again, birth rate, mortality rate, and immigration. And we adjust those looking at historical data about how our region has compared to the country as a whole. Slide. So we want to give a little context for uh, what's going on kind of nationally and internationally with our and how that compares to what we're looking at with the region. 
So the U.S. context is that we're still growing, but the rate of growth has slowed down recently. Uh, the years 2019, 2020, and 2021 had 100 year lows in growth, with 2021 specifically being the first time in over a century we had a population increase of under 1 million people. The census projects uh, the national population and releases those every three to five years. Uh, the most recent uh, release was last fall. Um, and notably, the most recent release for the census, as you can see in this graph, was much lower than the previous forecasts they had done. Uh, specifically for 2050, our plan horizon, uh, the national population is projected to be 28 million fewer people than it was the last time the census did these projections. Um, also notable that beyond our horizon year in 2080, for the first time, the census has projected that the U.S. population will start to decrease. Fine. So this, is, this slide shows our draft regional forecast. The uh, blue bars show the census uh, counted data for the region every 10 years through 2020. And the green bars show how the CMAP forecast has changed uh, from 2018 to 2022 to 2024. Uh, this light green color uh, on the far right is our current draft regional forecast. Um, and I'll pause for a second, people look at this. So some of the big takeaways, we are projecting the region to grow, but that rate of growth is slower than it has been projected at past forecasts. This is in part because the birth rate in the region and as the country as a whole has really decreased, especially since the 2008 recession, and it has never really fully recovered. Uh, we're also seeing lower job growth in the forecasts that we purchase, uh, in part because that forecast uses some of the census projections that are now lower. Um, and it's worth noting that migration will be a big influence in kind of the rate of growth of the region going forward. In the past few years, we've been seeing uh, net negative domestic migration, so more people moving out of the region to other parts of the U.S. than are moving in. That has been offset in part by international positive international migration, so people moving from abroad into the region. Uh, and Carlos is now going to give a little bit of an overview of some of the implications of these trends. Alex is kind of tall. All right, thanks, Alex. Uh, yeah, so um, an aging population and declining birth rates are uh, some of the main factors contributing to slower growth, not only in our region, but throughout the nation. And um, in the latest uh, U.S. Census uh, forecast in the year 2030, it's expected that those age 65 plus will outnumber youth. And that's the first time that's happened in U.S. history. And that's shown on the graph here on the slide. Uh, what you're seeing is the uh, forecast by age group. The blue bar is under age 18. And you'll notice that the uh, blue bar under age 18 is decreasing throughout the latest U.S. Census national forecast. And the green bar represents those 65 and old, older. And you'll notice that increasing uh, throughout the latest national forecast. And then we see that year 2030, in which the population age 65 and over uh, is estimated to uh, outnumber those under age 18. And this trend continues to the year 2100, when it's expected that the population 65 plus will go from 17% of the population to 29% of the population in the US. Next slide. Furthermore, uh, declining birth rates are also a factor uh, contributing to slower growth, not only in the region, but the nation. Uh, in that same U.S. Uh, national forecast, in the year 2038, deaths are projected to outnumber births in the U.S., and that's shown in the graph we're seeing on the slide. What this graph is showing are the components of annual change. So, for example, from the year 2022 to the year 2023, that first bar, uh, the U.S. nation grew by, uh, the U.S. grew by that much, and uh, it grew by a proportion, uh, the blue proportion, which is the natural change, which is births minus deaths, and the net international migration, which is in green. And you'll notice that uh, the blue bar, the blue proportion of annual change, slowly decrease as the years go by in the forecast, all the way until that year 2038, when it's expected that uh, deaths will number of births. And at that point, uh, immigration will be the main driver of uh, the U.S. Uh, population. Next slide. 
So going to a regional and state context, uh, in the region, we've seen that uh, from the year 2000 to 2010, the region's grown by 3.4%. And from 2010 to 2020, the region's grown by 1.7%. And in the year 2019, the Illinois Department of Public Health released their forecast to 2030, and they are show, uh, expecting uh, a regional growth rate of 0.5% uh, from 2020 to 2030. Uh, and in the Illinois De uh, Department of Public Health's forecast, uh, they're expecting a decrease in Cook County uh, with increases in the population from 2020 to 2030 uh, in the Collar counties. And that is shown on the, the table on the slide here. So uh, in discussions with uh, peer MPOs, uh, being a member of the AMPO uh, socioeconomic forecast leadership team, um, there's been this anticipation of slower growth given the data that would, we've been seeing, and that's reflected in their forecast as well. Uh, so in this table, what you'll see is the annual growth rate from 2010 to 2020 for various regions uh, throughout the US. And then you'll see the projected growth rate from 2020 to uh, 2050 for those regions. And the uh, growth rate uh, is uh, lower than that of the previous decade. Uh, some re regions uh, even decrease uh, in growth, growth rate. So next, uh, I'll pass it on to Alex to talk about previous forecasts. Right. Thanks, Carlos. So this graph shows the forecasted 2020 population um, for different form assets forecasts that NIPSI and CMAP have done over time. So you can see kind of this x-axis at the bottom. It's showing the year the forecast was done, um, but they're all forecast for the year 2020. Um, I'll note this doesn't include Kendall County because the early NIPSI forecasts were before Kendall was part of the CMAP region. Um, so some of the takeaways from this is that the CMAP forecast has been decreasing over time, uh, but despite that has tended to be a little bit high. Uh, for example, our 2014 forecast was off by half a million people compared to the uh, counted census number for that year. And some of the earlier forecasts were off by uh, over by over a million. Um, next slide. All right, so we wanna talk a little bit about the next steps and where we're going from here. Um, I'll note that the regional forecast is a draft. We're still in the context, uh, or we're still reviewing it internally. We're going to be meeting with external stakeholders to talk about the forecast as well. Um, and even if there's no major changes to the methodology, the uh, some of the inputs to the forecast, like the jobs forecast and the uh, economic projections uh, will be updated when we finalize the forecast. Uh, we're in the process, as mentioned, of working with Urban Sim, our consultant, on working on the local forecast, which again takes the regional forecast and allocates it across the region. That process is still ongoing. We're meeting with two different advisory groups. So one is a local advisory group from uh, people throughout the region uh, that work with municipalities and that understand kind of how the forecast impacts them and kind of some of the growth trends at the local level. And we're also working with a technical advisory group who are kind of industry experts at demographic forecasting and census data um, that are helping us understand kind of the types of assumptions we're making and whether or not those are correct. Um, and then we're also in the process of building a vision plan that will have a scenario planning process that thinks about different ways that the possibilities for, for growth in the region under different types of scenarios that might occur. Next slide. Uh, very briefly, this is the technical advisory group membership. You can review this slide um, later if you would like as well, but I want to highlight that the uh, Illinois State Data Center lead is on this technical advisory group, as well as the Illinois State Demographer who's the one that produces those uh, projections that Carlos shared earlier from the Department of Public Health. Next slide. And then this is some of the representation from our local advisory group. Um, we've asked each council of government and council of mayors to nominate a member. Um, not all of them have. So if you don't see somebody from your region in this area or in this slide, um, please reach out to either us or your uh, council of government or mayors and let them know that that they can take advantage of this opportunity. We'd like to get representation from as much of the region as possible to really get an understanding of what's going on at the local level. All right, thank you. We're happy to take any questions. Um, and this is my contact information. Questions? 
if if I may, just oh, I'm saying, go ahead. Thank you. Very interesting presentation. I love data. So I have a question about if your forecast, you mentioned some economic factors. What are those? That's my first question. And then my second question is, does this take into account climate migration as climate change obviously affects southern states and people start to migrate um, up to where it may be cooler? Yeah. So the economic factors to touch briefly, there's um, there's a few projections basically from the Congressional Budget Office where we have our jobs forecast. And part of the jobs forecast is saying, you know, we look at the number of births and deaths in the region, and then we look at the projected number of jobs. If there's more jobs and there are, you know, workers in the region, then we project people to move into the region to fill those jobs. And so the economic projections help us determine, you know, how many workers will be in the region given this level of population, how many people will actually have jobs. Um, the climate migration is something that we've been thinking about a lot. Um, I'll note that the jobs forecast that we get from Moody's Analytics does explicitly incorporate climate change. Uh, we can send you some of that methodology, but most of the sources we have seen doesn't think that our region will be like a big winner in terms of climate migration. There's some concern that parts of the region are very agricultural, which might get impacted by heat stress. Um, there's also concerns about access to water, even though we're near Lake Michigan, that is like there are international treaties that regulate how much water can be withdrawn. Um, and I think there's also a sense that if somebody gets, uh, you know, flooded out of Florida, perhaps that they're less likely to move to like Chicago, they're more likely to move to like Georgia or like somewhere that's like closer to them. And so we're still working with our scenario planning process. And we think that will be part of that, maybe looking at like, what if we do get more migration than we're expecting because of these climate change. But um, most of the sources that we have seen uh, don't think the region will be necessarily like a large winner. That's very helpful. I would love to see the methodology just because I'm curious and I like to see the information. Yeah. And two, the city of Chicago is holding a hearing about climate migration. Um, their subcommittee on immigration is holding a hearing on this. So um, I don't know if there's a connection there. I can, uh, I, I would have to give you the, maybe I'll follow with Aaron to, because there was a, <laughs> sorry, I'm stumbling because I'm trying to find the words. An alderman's office reached out to CNT for some information on climate migration. So I think it may be appropriate for you all to be talking to the alderman's office. Um, and I'm so sorry, I can't recall their name on the top of my head right now. But uh, if that's the information that you have, I think it would be helpful for the city of Chicago to have that. That's just a little tidbit. Yeah, clearly it's going to be a big factor in some of the growth of the region. And so it's something that we're definitely like trying to get as much information as we can. Just, you know, just as an observation, I, I you know, for cities and villages, uh, the, the U.S. Census is critical to us as far as determining revenue share dollars coming either state or federal, uh, which only comes out every 10 years. And it, it appears, which it, there was a report that came out about three or four months ago about like some super decline already in uh, various cities and villages, not whether it's optic or not. But uh, the fact is, you know, the U.S. Census is, is really the, the most reliable. And even with that, Illinois uh, apparently had claimed that you know they were undercounted uh, by X number of uh, uh, people. So I mean, there's some other factors involved in in and as we go forward, um, and the movement on an annual basis, uh, which I found pretty stark or, or strange, uh, that some communities were you know, already lost five percent of their population when you know the re most recent U.S. Census you know said they had a five percent increase. So I, I, I I'm I'm concerned as to the optics of all that. Uh, certainly with the public uh, and those who, who want to pre you know, predict or project that, you know, Illinois is declining, Chicago is declining or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but based upon really the only official census is the U.S., which only does it every 10 years. So I can see that the, the difficulty in trying to project in between those years uh, and certainly going back, I remember the years of Nipsey, uh, and unfortunately, I, I thought they overstated a lot of things uh, back then. In fact, there were some school districts uh, out southwest that, based upon those projections, ended up investing in schools that uh, the population never came. So, uh, you know, those numbers are critical, and in, in even in the short-term no numbers uh, that we try to get it right or get it uh, as best we can as far as a projection is concerned. Uh, but again, my, my concern is that you know, you've you seen these annual reports uh, based upon what? Uh, based upon one or two... Uh, whether it's a state or some private uh, consultant firm that coming out and saying, well, these are, you know, these are our projections. So 
how we go about going forward is, I think, is, is critical in, in optics, number one, and certainly in, in, in an emotional thing for those living in an area that think that, uh, you know, I better get out of here because, uh, you know, everybody's leaving. But I also agree with, with potentially with climate change uh, that's, that potentially the reverse may happen if, if it is going to be as dramatic as it is. And I'll just note, we're not taking those, uh, it's called the population estimate programs where the census tries to estimate the population without counting in the interim years. We're not taking those at face value. Um, there's some uh, disagreement among federal agencies about what the current population is. And uh, as mentioned, this jobs forecast at Moody's is, is looking at, they're working on incorporating some of this data from other agencies rather than just taking the like census measurements as given. No, I, I get it. I mean, your job is tough, let alone U.S. Census having a tough job in actually getting a count, uh, an accurate count that's always uh, certainly disputed every 10 years when that comes up also. So uh, it's not an easy thing to project. Looks like Mayor Hofert online has a question. Mayor, go ahead. You know, I, I would agree with a lot of what you said, um, and I'm not being critical of, of these guys at all. Um, I don't honestly... I don't think our census was correct in Mount Prospect. Now, this we're not a huge part of the region, but um, you know, I, I, because I think we're we've grown quite a bit, um, and they show us as almost flat. Um, but with climate change, I actually think people are going to move back. Um, you know, I, a, a friend of mine lives in Arizona. They went up to northern Wisconsin because it was 115 degrees in Phoenix the other day and um, they just couldn't take it. So, you know, it, it works both ways. Uh, you, you got the winters to deal with, I get it, but um, some of the areas of our country are going to be hot and um, really hot. And so I think you may see people moving back to northern regions um, and Illinois would certainly be one of them if we can fix some of our larger issues, let's say. So that was just an editorial comment. Yeah, thank you. I'll take the under on people moving up here for the winters uh, in exchange for uh, the heat in the South. Uh, but in any event, so still as a learning curve for me, um, please take this as just a question, Alex. Uh, so what? How do we use this data uh, in making decisions? And well, do we use this data? Is it that reliable that we're going to use it to make decisions here? Or is it nice to know? Uh, and why do we spend all the resources on this? So I'd like to understand how um, this is useful for this body. Yeah, I agree, Mary. That was my point about optics. Um... That play more of a role than than actuality and and uh, again it's a tough thing to try to to do certainly annually without without a full you know census a u.s census of a population which you'll never do on an annual basis so, so, so if i could just speak to how we will use it a little bit here uh, before if you don't mind um you know one of the things is is that this is a federal responsibility of the agency and so as we look out to 2050 we use this data to understand how much funding how much revenue there will be based on how many people are here who are driving to work who are getting the places that they need to go right and that really drives our transportation modeling as well and so we are are responsible and required to do the official forecast for, for the region. And then that becomes the data set that all sorts of tr transportation planning implementers utilize uh, for their projections as they're going through sort of their purpose and need and understanding their alternatives analysis for funding major projects across the region. So that is a responsive core responsibility of MPOs. I think that's why we wanted to bring this to you all because I know we do have a number of new members. This is something that is uh, that we've always done, but something that we haven't talked about at this board because we are just restarting the process. And I think also to our team is paying uh, special attention to understanding the nuances that the agency has uh, projected in previous years, right? When we get those numbers wrong, we don't want people to take them uh, and and use them in ways that are not, not appropriate, right? So right. For, for us, as we do this, like we really want to make sure that we're also thinking about sort of that slow...
coming to conclusion on is that we're going to have sort of modest, slow growth over the next couple of decades. Yeah, so for my edification, so I know this is required. We mm -hmm. have to do it. That's good. And we do do it. Uh, we try to be as accurate as possible. And it does translate into dollars and what we can do. That, that That's what I, I, I want to understand the link. That's all. Well, I mean, at my point right off the bat was, uh, you know, the, the U.S. Census every 10 years for local government is critical because it does reflect right. a share. And that will go on for 10 years. That doesn't change until the next census comes out, U.S. Census comes out in 10 years. So, yeah, for a city, uh, you know, sharing revenue or getting revenue from the state or the Fed, those numbers are critical. Um, but again, and my point was, you, there's no way you're going to change this every year. So that's why they lock into a 10 year. Right. And so for the, for the federal numbers, that's really about the dollar allocation from the feds down right. for us, for the local numbers and the regional numbers, it's about then the investment strategy, right? And where are we making those investments and what can we uh, anticipate happening if we're thinking about rebuilding a corridor, a transportation corridor, and how people might move through that, and what sort of the accommodations we might want to consider if, if we're expecting an aging population versus a younger population. So that, my point is, yeah. so we'll make a decision in part, or maybe largely based on this data, if, if, if we're trying to decide but, what transportation in a certain corridor Correct. It does drive a lot we'll, of That's we'll factor this in. Yes. More regional, okay. Yes. Yep. Carolyn, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's fine. Thank you. And um, to, to kind of go off of that as well, so how we'll utilize it, but I know in McHenry County, we utilize this information greatly. And it's and so I wanted to go back to the slide that you had where um, the projections were off, um, and you showed it over three three decades, I don't know, or the time period, that the three different type, time periods and how are significantly lower than originally anticipated. And I know this had created a, a great deal of um, controversy and conversation up in McHenry County, you know, maybe a decade ago. Um, so in, you had related it to birth rate and job growth, lower job growth. Um, but I guess we're, you know, we're constantly planning to accommodate the challenges that we face. So how do we then um, make future projections while incorporating, you know, fixes to those challenges that we have faced and, and really planning for that? You know, I don't know if you mean like, so we're on the decline and it looks like you're continuing that decline in your estimations, but will it truly continue? Or are we addressing those issues that caused that, um, the offset of those numbers to begin with? I, I think you raise a really good question that probably if I had any answers for that were exacting, I wouldn't be in this job because I'd, I'd, you know, I, I'd be doing something else. I, if we could go back a couple more slides here, because it was the, uh, nope, a couple more back. It was that, very uh, early. This one. one here. Right. And so I, I, I think over the years, the agency has taken a couple different approaches, right? The 2040 plan really looked at a number of scenarios, like what if possibilities. And if we did all of the things the plan said, we would be more likely to achieve high population growth. But that would mean we would need to think about fixing governance policies, thinking about you know, reducing flooding, right? All of those things. I think the approach that we're taking now is really more of a, what is the most realistic expectation uh, into the future? And how can we provide sort of not this like, you know, what if scenario of, of future growth, because that number, all the numbers are always wrong, right? It, it, it's scenario planning. I think what we learned during the pandemic, right, is that there's a range of options. You have a high scenario, a low scenario, and you're like business as usual scenario. So we're trying to get to sort of a, a realistic scenario here in terms of what we have and what we happen. But we recognize too, that I think like Mayor Hofert said earlier on is that it is, it is the, the political climate is important to what decisions people make for their households. Um, there are all sorts of other things. So I think, um, you know, my rambling answer here is just that it depends and we want to provide good data to our counties and our municipalities moving forward, um, which is why I'll just plug that if your COG or COM is not listed there, we will be doing direct outreach to them to find a, an individual to help sort of us ground truth as we move from this regional um, number to the local number. Looks like Mayor No. Sorry. Yeah, oh, I have no. a oh, couple of quick things, if I might. You um, know what? Mayor No, hold on. I, I cut Carolyn off here. Let, okay. let me let Carolyn go. I just have a couple more follow ups because is this comparable to the national average? Like, have you looked at, at that aspect or it's very comparable? 
well, we, we kind of showed the, the census projections. I think the, uh, the region is projected to be slightly lower than national growth rates because that's just the way that um, kind of past trends have shown and that Moody's has kind of talked about this methodology. States in the Midwest don't have as much of like a demographic uh, advantage and the industries aren't projected to grow as much. The industries in the US or in the Midwest compared to like other areas. And so in terms of the general trend of um, slower growth that we're seeing going forward, but still positive growth, that's in line with the census. But I think we're a little bit lower than the kind of nation as a whole, that projected rate. And I guess that's where I was kind of getting at, because I find this a little depressing. I mean, in all honesty, um, because I feel I like... say optics. <laughs> well, okay, so that's my optic of... Um, I feel like we're a little bit like rolling over on, on the whole thing and accepting it. And I, it may, may be a reality, but at the same time, I just, I wish we could incorporate a little bit more of a, um, uh, trying to overcome the challenges that we've been facing and how do we do that to really change these these numbers and go back with those original projections and where we are, or even let's aim for the national average. I mean, like, let's kind of go in that direction because I, I, I feel like, just looking out and saying, okay, we're just going to continue down this path because that's kind of this like doom and go path where we've been headed down. Like, I just would like to see a little bit, um, maybe how do we overcome this a little? I think that's part, I, I would, part of Nina's comment is, is a major factor climate? Is a major factor taxes? Right. Um, those are right. the economy. So I, I think we all regionally or even microly from our towns or counties try to, you know, do what we can to attract. So that's a positive. We're still continuing to do that. But that was my point about having these numbers come out every year and, and everybody's doom and gloom with uh, it's declining 4%, 3%, 2%. And so these numbers can play a big role in, in from the mindset right. uh, or an optic standpoint. So Well, and maybe even just presenting the two different ones. You know, if we do nothing, this is where we're headed. If we do this, this, and this, this is where we're headed. It would be just nice to see that, like, contrast. And, you know, Nina, you had mentioned even about, you know, the climate aspect of it. I mean, I've com heard a completely opposite report of what you've given. So, you know, like, yeah, I would like to see those, almost to those two comparisons because this just looks like, uh, really stagnant and kind of, it doesn't inspire me to want to do good work in the region. And I think we need to want to, oh. and, and sorry for that, but it really, you know, it just, I, I think we need a little bit more of um, an uplifting scenario for us to actually aspire to be, if that is my, my colleague from policy has a quick. Ms. Julie. Um, hi, I'm Elizabeth Ginsberg. I'm a senior policy analyst in RPI, and I just jumped out of my seat because I had to add to this. I think for the way we think about this, this is our starting point. We really, I think Aaron said, we want to put out kind of a realistic base scenario. This is what we think is the most likely thing to happen. But also, this is why we have on to 2050. This is why we think about inclusive growth, prior prioritized investment, resilience for the region. Those are the policies that will help us attract people here and make this a region that people want to live in and work in and play in. And those are the kinds of policies and conversations we will be continuing to have as a part of the RTP process and the vision plan. So I, this isn't the end point. This is really just the starting point. If we can move on, Mayor, Mayor Doki, you're on the line. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to interject one thing here real quick because we have this notion that all growth has to be positive. It's not always the case. I'm not against growth. But controlled balance growth actually has its merits. Um, you know, it, growth requires additional costs, too. So we shouldn't always automatically think that we have to have growth in order to be a good region. That doesn't necessarily mean that it, it automatically. Um, one thing I'd like to really discuss is on our aging population in the region. Um, one thing I, I think that I never see addressed is how do we deal with uh, dual residency, uh, especially our snowbirds or people who are residing part of the year in one particular state or region and then part of the year in our, our region, but maybe primarily move their residency to another state, but they're still here for very much almost half the year. How are we accounting for that? because they're not being counted in the census. And there's a large and growing number of those individuals throughout the region. 
I don't have a great answer to that at this point. That's something we can kind of look into. I think, um, as mentioned, a lot of the, the forecast is based on the projected number of jobs in the region. I think in the case, like many of the snowboards will be retired. Um, and so that's something that we can kind of follow back up with. Well, I mean, it, we could be talking tens of thousands, if not significantly higher than that. I mean, you know, this is a significant problem because, you know, when you're talking about thousands and thousands of different of individuals who are still here the, a good chunk of the year and are requiring or needing resources are in our transportation system, all of our various, uh, you know, infrastructure and impacting them, uh, it, that is a major part of the, the calculation here. I mean, the reality is while our full-time population may be becoming stagnant, you know, we may have a significant part-time population that is not being accounted for at all, but still requires a significant amount of resources for us to, to properly address their needs. Um, you know, and that's something that, you know, I, I don't see anybody trying to address right now. Um, one other thing that came up during the census and its many multitude of problems and, and its numbers of this last census was the fact that because of the pandemic era, a lot of major undercounting was done at major universities throughout Illinois uh, because they weren't allowed to count on, on campus population the way they normally do. How have we addressed that and its impact on the various regions throughout, throughout the, our planning area? Yeah, so I, I will note that um, the the jobs projections in part take the, the census data, but they're also looking at things like consumer spending, GDP, and some of these things that might capture, you know, some of the, um, you know, the snowboards or the college students. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll just note that. Um, and the, the jobs forecast for the region, again, is a, a big driver of some of these things. And I think that the Moody's is not just taking those census numbers as a given. It's not saying like the 2020 census is like the kind of end all be all for here. And I think we know that there were some some undercounts and that the census has acknowledged that. Um, and that so well, and those can be significant for, for and those are significant for areas of you know a few thousand you know shift in population when we're talking about transportation planning is a significant number uh, for some areas and can and can direct directly dra drastically impact them and their ability to receive funding adequately. Um, but, uh, and then on the jobs numbers, and I brought this up in the past, and I don't know to this day that it's really, it's truly adequately addressed the way it should be, but it, there is definitely still to this day, uh, even though they're not supposed to be, jobs that are being counted in the wrong communities because of temporary agencies or corporate headquarters reallocating them and saying that their pay stubs are coming out of a location where they actually don't work. And I do not feel that the enforcement of that is being done adequately, which is leaving job numbers skewed in ways that they shouldn't be. And you know, this is part of the reason we uh, purchased this economic forecast from like an, an industry leader in one of these rather than trying to do it ourselves. There are a lot of nuances to this. And we think that Moody's does a good job of using a variety of data sources in addition to census data, try to incorporate, uh, try to address some of these issues. They've been thinking a lot about kind of, you know, how to capture where a job is and these things. And that's why we're kind of deferring to their expertise on some of these questions. Yeah, I understand, but I'm not, you know, I haven't seen their methodology either. And I'm not always convinced that the industry looks at those types of, uh, le that level of minutia when it comes to individual regions within a planning area, so. Well, thanks, Leanne. Oh, I was actually just gonna comment when Carolyn was talking about, I mean, that's sort of the, Population data and demographics is only one input to the plan. There's a lot of other economic data, revenue, tax base data, all that sort of stuff. And that's kind of the point of the plan is to think about what the future is and come up with scenarios, ideas about what that future might look like and how do we then tweak our policies, programs, procedures to try to get to an outcome that we're hoping to get to. Yeah, to that comment and also Mayor notes, uh, you know, quality versus quantity, how's that? So, and I think we all strive for quality, whether it's a metro region or micro down to our community. So that something to consider. And I think some of these questions could be related at the next U.S. Census about dual residency or whether, you know, you do have to declare one state or the other, but whether or not that question is even put into a U.S. Census, do you share a dual registry until you get an accurate count? And, and again, they're the ones that officially do the accurate count. Uh, that would help. So we All have right, a two-part yeah. presentation today. Yeah.
because we did want to link these things together because they are closely aligned is that the, you know this is part of the information that goes into our long range transportation plan julie is going to talk a little bit about where we're at with that and some of the work that's been underway julie welcome thank you good morning my name is julie rushke i'm a policy analyst with cmap Today, I'll be summarizing some existing transportation goals as we head into early discussions about the potential vision of the regional transportation plan, or as we'll refer to it, the RTP. I think this is a helpful conversation to have following the socioeconomic forecast as we think about the future that you would like to see for Northeastern Illinois and the role that transportation plays in that. So last meeting, CMAP staff gave an overview of the purpose, timeline, and process for the RTP. As the federally designated metropolitan planning organization for this region, CMAP must develop a long range transportation plan every four years. In the past, the transportation plan was included <clears throat> in the comprehensive plans of go to 2040 and on to 2050. Specifically, the transportation plan was included in on to 2050's um, mobility chapter, financial plan, regionally significant projects and relevant appendices. This upcoming RTP will maintain the same 2050 horizon year and must be completed by October 2026 per federal guidelines. The purpose of the RTP is to be a forward thinking plan that guides transportation investments, she works. She works. policies and initiatives. Out there and she lives. Okay. Uh, that guides uh, transportation investments, policies and initiatives within North Northeastern Illinois. And building on the foundation set in ONDA 2050, the RTP will outline a transportation vision that aligns with broader regional goals and reflects the diverse needs and aspirations of communities throughout the region. The RTP development process is guided by three overarching questions. What is the future transportation system we want? What are the challenges and opportunities to get there? And how will we achieve the trans transportation system we want? Each of these questions are informed by different work streams under the RTP. For the first question, goals and objectives and the metrics associated with them will help identify the region's vision for transportation. Next, analyses of existing conditions and travel demand will articulate what's currently happening in the region, while the socioeconomic forecast and analyses of future needs will provide insight into opportunities and challenges in the future. And lastly, as goals, opportunities, and challenges are identified, the region can begin establishing how it will achieve its vision for transportation by analyzing and prioritizing capital investments, preparing a long-term financial plan, and setting strategies and implementation measures. It's important to note that some of the phases of work on the screen will be fluid to account for um, new information gained throughout the RTP development process. For example, the goal setting phase that we're currently in will be fluid to account for um, new information through the socioeconomic forecast and analysis of um, existing conditions. This overview is merely intended to provide a high level summary of how the many work streams under the RTP will come together cohesively in the final plan. Next slide, please. There are some federal and state requirements that are relevant to goal setting in the RTP. First, the RTP must align with federal goals, which are to improve safety, maintain a state of good repair, reduce congestion and improve reliability, improve freight movement, promote environmental sustainability and complete projects on schedule. And per state law, the RTP must also reflect the relationship between transportation and land use, economic development, air quality and energy consumption. And lastly, the RTP must consider the goals, metrics and other details included in plans by local governments and transit agencies. This is a task that staff have recently completed, and I think leads us nicely into the next slide. So recently, C C CMAP staff uh, reviewed and summarized nearly 30 plans adopted by the federal government, state of Illinois, CMAP itself, county governments, transit agencies, and other stakeholders in the region. Included in your agenda packet is a memo detailing the process to review these plans and summarize common goals, objectives, and strategies. On the screen are the overarching goals um, that were identified through the plan review. Some examples include increasing mobility and accessibility, which speaks to objectives to manage congestion, support transit access, and expand the bike and pedestrian network. There's also the goal to improve safety and security, which aims to promote safe travel. 
invest in infrastructure that improves safety and centralize data on safety. And a final example would be to preserve the existing system by prioritizing a state of good repair and maintaining and expanding funding opportunities for system maintenance. Reviewing plans adopted in the region revealed common themes across shared priorities. While not every plan includes each of the goals listed on the screen, the summary intends to broadly represent the overarching goals that guide transportation plans in Illinois. The RTP is intended to be a plan for the whole region where every community can see their interests and needs represented. Conducting the plan review was a crucial first step to begin understanding the transportation priorities set by diverse stakeholders throughout the region, which is a task that will continue through robust outreach and engagement throughout the plan development. For more information about the summary of the plan review, please refer to the memo included in your agenda packet. So as stated previously, the RTP will build on the transportation vision that was set in ONDA 2050. The ONDA 2050 comprehensive plan was originally adopted in 2018 and updated in 2022. In the plan, the region achieved consensus on many transportation priorities, which are reflected in all five of the plan chapters. Today, we'll primarily focus on the mobility chapter, which sets the over, overarching vision of a modern multimodal system that adapts to changing travel demand, a system that works better for everyone, and a region that makes transformative investments. By reviewing the foundation set and on to 2050, we have the opportunity to consider how the RTP could build off these goals. The mobility chapter in ONDA 2050 set a broad range of transportation goals. Um, some of the goals listed on the screen are to fully fund the region's transportation system, enhance the approach to transportation programming through more performance-based criteria and project evaluation. There's also the goal to harness technology to improve travel and anticipate future impacts and improve travel safety. And continuing on to the next slide, there's also the goal to make transit more competitive, maintain the region's status as a freight hub by promoting network efficiency and mitigating risks to adjacent communities. There's the goal to leverage the transportation network to promote inclusive growth or more equitable outcomes in local communities. And finally, um, there's the goal to improve the resilience of the transportation network to weather and climate change. While ONDA 2050 goes into, oh, if you could go back, please. While ONDA 2050 goes into greater detail about actions that could implement each of these overarching goals, the high level summary that was shared on the screen represents topics where the region recently achieved consensus on major transportation priorities. As we, begin, we, as we begin conversations about potential RTP goals, ONDA 2050 serves as a starting point to consider what's the region, region's vision for transportation today. As stated previously, the RTP will not be a plan just for CMAP. It's a plan for the whole region where all stakeholders will play a role. It's important that all communities in the region ultimately see themselves reflected in the RTP vision. And based on current transportation plans in the region and recent progress achieving consensus in ONDA 2050, the region appears to envision a transportation that's fully funded, regionally coordinated, connected across modes, safe, efficient, and reliable, resilient to climate change, accessible, inclusive, and equitable, supportive of economies, and responsive to change in emerging technologies. As we begin considering goals for the RTP, we'll discuss how you would like the RTP to build off this foundation. And since 2050 was originally uh, adopted in 2018, the region has made significant progress implementing its goals. All implementers, local governments, transportation agencies, county governments, the state of Illinois, and federal partners have made essential contributions to advance key transportation priorities. On the screen is just a snapshot of some of these efforts. The Rebuild Illinois funding package provided crucial support to transportation projects, the RTA's Transit is the Answer identified solutions to the transit fiscal cliff and to improve the passenger experience and align transit with other key goals like equity and climate. The Plan of Action for Regional Transit, also known as PART, identifies recommendations that can help the region invest in a stronger and more financially secure transit system. CMAP's Community Alliance for Regional Equity, or CARE, has sought to make our investment processes more equitable and to strengthen collaboration with local communities. Additionally, the RTA and CMAP, as was presented on earlier today, have partnered on regional calls for projects to collaborate with municipalities and provide resources and technical assistance. 
And last but certainly not least, the Safe Travel for All Roadmap, also known as STAR, represents partnerships with county governments to develop safety action plans, advance straight, safe street standards, and implement speed management best practices. While all of these efforts have been important for advancing the region's transportation priorities, they're just a handful of the immense amount of work that has been underway. As we head into discussion, it may help to reflect on transportation progress that's been made in your community. Is there momentum the region should continue or gaps that we should address? And to look ahead just a bit, as the region achieves consensus on the goals of the RTP, the conversation will ultimately shift to how you would like to implement the goals through efforts similar to those on the screen. These conversations will happen and they'll take place a bit later in 2025. And lastly, before we get into discussion, I would like to preview some next steps. Throughout the summer and fall of this year, the RTP team will be meeting with transportation stakeholders to have more detailed conversations about the vision and goals of the RTP. Later this year, CMAP will also open a public survey to further inform the RTP vision and goals. And in the near future, we'll open an online portal where agencies, organizations, or individuals can submit materials they would like CMAP to consider for the RTP. And lastly here, CMAP has recently created a site where we'll post information and updates about the RTP. The link for that site is on the screen, and I think your agenda packet includes a one-pager that also features that link. Okay, so now heading into dis discussion, reflecting on the goals summarized as a part of the plan review and the ONDA 2050 recap, we'd like to open it up to you all to hear your thoughts. Are the goals we reviewed still relevant to today's needs and priorities? What's needed to make progress or move forward? And are there emerging or evolving issues you would like to address? Discussion, comments, yes, Mayor. Oops. Mayor, go ahead. So uh, isn't the fundamental discussion, where's the money? It's always been a question. So, I mean, I, I get it. I'm, I'm, I, I guess I'm a glass half full person. That's why I, my wife is a glass overflowing. That's why we get along. But, um, um, you know, and I've been around, you've been around, everybody's been around. And it's great to have all of these discussions. But at the municipal level, if you're a mayor or, or here at CMAP, where's the money? Um, you know, is there even, um, uh, you know, where do we go to people and say, if you give us this money, we'll do this, but can we get the money? And I'd like to know how we're going to get the money. Mary, you make a good point. And I think from this agency, from day one, that question was raised every year up until I think approximately about five years ago, when money finally started coming, not certainly at the rate that we would have liked it, but certainly federal state programs that have been instituted uh, in the areas of transportation infrastructure have have been significant, but the need obviously is is still huge. And and I guess our point as a board or mayors is to state back to our our state and federal stakeholders. Uh, continue. We you know this is just not necessarily a stopgap or whether it was an economic uh, uh, piece of legislation to infuse into the economy, but it it can't stop. I mean the the investments uh, whether at the scale it's been over the last five years. Uh, but certainly a continuing uh, uh, level of, uh, of of increase, and certainly with even with the federal bills, as you recall, years ago they were fighting whether even to fund the you know fund the bills or cut it back. So, yeah, there 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 are still major major needs. Other comments, questions, Mayor? It, it, I'm sorry, Mayor Reinbold, for folks online, if you wouldn't mind using the microphone. Your mic. microphone. Yep. Sorry. Thank you. On the uh, stakeholder engagement, are you are you anticipating reaching out to the COGS, IDOT, who are you contemplating? For yes, absolutely. We'll be, um, we've already talked with our federal partners, so FTA, FHWA, we'll be coordinating with IDOT, RTA, all the transit agencies, county governments, COGS, comms, and especially if there's anyone that comes to mind that you really would like us to connect with, we're more than happy to take recommendations there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other comments, questions? Thank you very much. Moving on to our next uh, item, and that's the speed manager report. Victoria Barrett. Well, and as Vicki comes up here too, I think again, we uh, this was a last minute addition to the agenda here, but the speed uh, speed management report was complete. We wanted to get this in front of you. So we recognize we've spent a lot of time talking about a lot of different things. Vicki's prepared to uh, adjust her presentation to match yes. her time this exactly. morning. Thank it you, Vicki. But it's an important issue. We can Two always minutes. bring it back. Two minutes, <laughs> yes, thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you for making time on the agenda for me today and this important report, which is now available online. I just checked the links. So thank you to our communications department for that. Um, my name is Victoria Barrett. I am a senior planner in CMAP's Regional Policy and Implementation Division. And I'm here today to share um, an overview of this report, which is released as of today on a key traffic safety issue in our region, that is speeding. Uh, this report, as Julie just mentioned, is part of the STAR program, CMAP's commitment to improving travel safety from our on to 2050 plan. Um, STAR is a five-year effort of defined projects to improve traffic safety in the region, and this report is part of that program. Um, this work and the STAR program are both aligned with something called the safe system approach, which um, I can go into more detail at a future meeting, but this is a new approach, a more comprehensive, integrated approach to addressing travel safety that has taken cues from the aviation industry in providing preventative layers of safety, and we are now translating that into our surface transportation network. The speed management report is composed of five chapters. Um, we address our current safety crisis. I'll talk a little bit about that today. The role of speed in traffic safety. And then um, we have three chapters of key findings and recommendations from the research and analysis that we did. Um, they are organized by safer roads, safer speeds, and safer road users. So addressing our current safety crisis, as you've heard at previous meetings, our region and in, indeed the nation have seen an increasing number of traffic fatalities on our roadways. That number after decades of decline started to tick upwards about 2014. The same is true for our region. Um, there the, com the reasons behind this are quite complex. Um, you may also remember that during the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw a, a spike in traffic fatalities. Um, despite a, a reduced amount of travel. So some alarming trends have ha, had taken place during that time. We are still above pre-pandemic le levels in terms of traffic fatalities in our region, but they have come down slightly. And uh, this is a, a potent reminder that traffic fatalities are an equity issue. And this is true nationwide as well in our region. We see black residents overrepresented in traffic fatalities in our region. Again, the reasons are complex. We go into some of the details um, about why this may be true in our paper, but speeding is certainly um, a role in this. And finally, um, it doesn't have to be this way. So in the United States, when you look at um, traffic deaths as a public health threat, our numbers are double that of other kind of peer countries that have similar land use patterns and similar travel patterns. So other countries have taken stronger action on managing speeds and improving traffic safety through various regulations and enforcement activities. Um, the United States number is exceptionally high. So briefly, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the role of speed in traffic safety in general. Speed is a contributing factor in about 45 to 50% of all fatal crashes in, in our region and, and nationwide. In Illinois, that translates into over 1,200 deaths over a five-year period. In our efforts to understand how speed was a risk or is a risk on our roadways, we wanted to understand where speeding-related fatal and serious injury crashes were happening. And one of the ways in which we were able to do that was to assign crashes to the roads and find out their posted speed limit. This finding is particularly interesting because you will notice the posted speed limits at the bottom of this chart and the rates of crashes for both vehicles and cyclists and pedestrians are highest at the 30 mile per hour posted speed limit. One might think that these fatality rates would be higher on higher speed roadways, but in fact, it is the 30 mile per hour roadways, the most prevalent speed limit in our region where we're seeing the most fatal and serious injury crashes. And that's important because we know that the risks associated with 30 mile per hour travel are quite high. So this is um, a graphic that shows the chance of a pedestrian surviving a crash with a vehicle traveling at 20 miles per hour, 30 miles per hour and 40 miles per hour. 
at 30 miles per hour, which is the current Illinois statutory speed limit, a pedestrian has a 45% chance of dying if struck by a vehicle traveling that speed. These, these research and these data don't take into account the fact that not every pedestrian is a full-size adult, and they don't take into effect that many cars are now larger and heavier than they used to be, so these numbers are likely even higher. And that's important because when we look at the roadways where 30 miles per hour is the posted speed limit, they are complex environments. They are environments where people are crossing the street. They are environments where people are riding their bicycles. They are environments where children are going to schools, where shopping is happening, cars are parking, and people are accessing businesses and services. One important finding um, that, that one of the risks associated with speed is not only does it increase the time and distance it takes to stop a vehicle, but it also reduces a driver's ability to detect hazards alongside the roadway. It's called the field of vision of the driver, and it's a way that our, um, our brains and our optic activities kind of just focus on a smaller view out of the front of our vision. So, so it is really important because it, it really prevents drivers from being able to detect upcoming hazards, whatever they may be. I, uh, I won't give a physics lesson here, but I do need to mention the concept of kinetic energy, which is the damaging force that is delivered by a vehicle in a collision. Um, it's important to understand this because this has changed over time, the role of kinetic energy in crashes, because it is a function of both a speed of the object traveling and the weight of the vehicle. And as I will show very briefly next, um, our vehicle fleet these days is larger and heavier than it used to be. So if you look at this graphic, it shows the, the vehicle fleet, this is the passenger vehicle fleet, so privately owned vehicles, between 1975, 2000, and 2021. In 1975, 81% of the vehicle fleet were sedans. Those are lower to the ground, they have a, a lower hood, point of contact, and they're lighter weight than SUVs, which only made up 2% of the fleet in 1975. But today, SUVs make up 56% of the fleet. They are taller, they are heavier, and they are larger and deliver more kinetic energy when they are in crashes. So the speed limits and the way that we addressed speeding back in 1975 is no longer appropriate. And the important point here is, to, is that small, small reductions in average operating speeds. So when you can slow down every car by just one mile per hour below 30 miles per hour, you can reduce the risk of fatal crashes globally by 17%. So speed management is worth doing. These are um, benefits that are achievable with small changes in the way we do business. And I'll quickly go over some of our key findings and recommend recommendations. Again, I encourage you to go and download the full report and executive summary, which are available on CMAP's website today. we really looked at three kinds of uh, aspects in which we could intervene to improve speed management. One is through improving roadway design and capacity guidance to reduce speeding and the exposure by all travelers to safety risks of speeding. The second category is addressing speed limits in our region. We are um, happily, the nation and, and much of the guidance is moving away from things like the 85th percentile speed limit setting method in urban areas, but there are other opportunities for us to lower speed limits in locations where there are large populations of people walking, biking, and using transit. And finally, there are many opportunities associated with um, improving education and equitable enforcement so that enforcement practices are aligned with clear safety outcomes and that we really leverage knowledge, preventative education policies that can teach people the risks of speeding through driver's ed curricula and those types of activities and, and really support safer drivers in general. And that is an great, overview. Great report, comments, questions? Sure. 
when you say um, 30, 30 miles an hour or 20 miles an hour, is that actual speed they're going or is that posted speed limit? It's the posted speed limit on the roadway. Yeah, so okay. it could very well be a different speed Okay, so that, operating. It, it could be enforcement issue when you're talking about that one to five uh, mile per hour difference. It could actually be enforcement and not necessarily lowering the speed in that area. Um, yeah, yes, enforcement definitely could play a role in bringing down average operating speeds as well, as can you know, the other aspects I mentioned. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Argue with some of the data. Um, unfortunately, I was around and driving in 1975, uh, and uh, those cars were a lot bigger, a lot heavier. And the advantage of an SUV today is actually the sight line. You are higher. I, I know my wife would say she thinks... She She'd rather have an SUV because she's she's higher up and she sees more. So I don't know that I, I buy some of that data um, uh, on that issue, that an SUV is more dangerous now today than a sedan was in 1975. So. Yeah, I'm sure those stats are based upon a vehicle. If it was an SUV, got in an accident, somebody got killed. The only observation I would like to make is that enforcement, I, I think this should be a public safety message given weekly. Uh, because as local government officials and trying to make our roads safer, you know, there are other things and tools out there which the public is not very happy about, whether it's speed cameras or red speed cameras. All they look at that as a revenue source for the city. Uh, but, you know, the, the main reason is to reduce speed. So those things may not, you know, go together, but I, I think from a public safety, people would be pretty, pretty impressed with those numbers to see what's going on. Yes, I agree. Messaging is important. Yeah. Thank you. I, I find this information really helpful. And in, in my career in both Los Angeles and Chicago, I've worked on uh, Vision Zero and have looked at the statistics, have looked at the data, have looked at the trends. And I think what you've presented is consistent with as me as a professional planner has seen and also has has understood and looked into the methodology and data. So I, I, I would say that, you know, based on my professional experience, this seems to be an accurate depiction and I think enforcement, again, with some of the notes that were pointed out, is a discriminatory way, and it is usually for Black and Brown communities, um, a disproportionate way to discriminate against uh, Black and Brown communities. Um, and so, I, so for me, again, as a professional planner who has done this work, uh, I don't know that enforcement is actually the way to go. It really is about the design of the roadway. Um, in the design of streets that will help us keep our community safe. Enforcement is not necessarily, I understand that that is usually the first place that people go, but statistically that is not a way to actually stop deaths. That's just a way to get black and brown people tickets and eventually in jail and compromise their livelihoods. Um, and so I, for me, I would say I would like CMAP to continue to look at ways of design to help with uh, fatalities. And again, there's lots of statistics, lots of data, lots of studies across, around the country. Again, Los Angeles has a huge Vision Zero program that I was able to work with. Um, and these trends are happening everywhere. So I understand that at, at face value, you may not understand or, 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 or take the data, but I will say that this is something that lots of professionals, lots of smarter, smarter people than me, have worked on for, for many years. And I think the way to go is more so the design of the roadways and how can we actually make communities safer without uh, perpetuating harm in communities that we know are already over enforced and over police. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you for mentioning that. I, we really focused on design. The opportunities there are immense. Yeah, the, the full report details a lot of design elements that I think we should be thinking about. But I want to thank Vicki. Yes. I think one of the other things that we are open to doing, too, as we transition um, here to the next topic is that if you would like us to come out, talk with you, talk with your COGS or your councils, I think the next point for us is really to, to, to talk to people about this data and the full report and understand some of the complexities that you're working on, because this isn't something we're doing now and done with. It's something that we've made a commitment to continue to work on over the next few years here and probably in perpetuity. Thank you. Thank you. John? Now they've got you down to about one minute, John. So. John's always brief. Okay, I can get through that in no time. Um, thanks. As Aaron mentioned, the RPA modernization bill passed both houses of the legislature unanimously and uh, has gone to the governor. We anticipate him signing it shortly. The RPA appropriation bill, um, however, the funding bills were not incorporated in the FY25 budget. We're going to continue to work with members of the General Assembly and, um, and, and the governor's office to advance this appropriation in the next, next legislative session. Or if we have an opportunity earlier than that, we will take advantage of that. We appreciate your time and attention to this and welcome your input 
on how to strengthen this ask uh, for next session. The governor has signed into law the uh, $53 billion FY25 budget appropriation and the implementation legislation. We are continuing to review the details of the FY25 budget, uh, but we do have one important transportation funding takeaway. And we wanted to highlight that for you. Uh, the RTA Act requires the road fund to provide $150 million to the public transportation fund each year, plus funds for de RTA debt service. The remainder of the public of the uh, public transportation funds annual funding has historically come from the general fund. As noted earlier, the governor's FY25 budget proposal sought to increase the required $150 million transfer from the road fund to the PTF by $175 million, totaling $325 million. The final FY25 budget implementation legislation instead increases the transfer from the road fund to the PTF by only 75 million, totaling 225 million. It also calls for uh, 50 million dollars from the leaking underground storage tank fund, the Lust Fund, to be transferred to the PTF. Both the 75 million dollar and 50 million dollar transfers included in the FY25 uh, budget implementation plan are one-time transfers to occur only in FY25. However, this sets a precedent for similar transfers in the future. The main takeaway is the transfers do not provide new revenue for transportation, but rather shift the funding burden from the PTF away from the general fund. This does not meet the transportation system's operating and capital needs at a time when additional funds are needed and long, the long-term sustainability of existing revenue sources like the motor fuel fund continues to be at risk. I don't know, Leanne, if you have anything you wanna to add to that action by the General Assembly. Um, no, that just that it's an ongoing conversation that we have with them. I mean, transit is an eligible expense under the, the, the lockbox, and we were already receiving money out of those funds. So this was a govern the governor's original proposal, not a transit proposal. Um, continue the conversation both with our friends on the highway side as well as with the legislature. So. Another legislation, both houses. The House and the Senate passed House Bill 5511, the Procurement Omnibus Bill. One change of note included uh, in this bill is the restoration of the MPO language stricken last session from the Public-Private Partnerships for Transportation Act that requires any transportation facility developed under this act to be consistent with the regional plan of the MPO and whose boundary the project is located. This is something we were working on at the end of last session and we're pleased to see this language uh, restored. Uh, as you all know, at the end of April, the Clean and, Equitable, Clean and Equitable Transportation Act was filed. This is an omnibus bill that includes several different transit and climate provisions that would, that would impact the region. The Metropolitan Mobility Authority Act offers a range of governance reforms, including consolidating the RTA and the service boards into one entity to manage transit in the region. As we shared at our last meeting, we think it's important to maintain the three-legged stool approach that we, took, uh, that we took in the part report as the focus now shifts to legislative action. The General Assembly will be holding subject matter, subject matter hearings this summer on various issues related to transit operations, funding, and governance. We'll be happy to, serve, uh, to, to, to share with you more details on the hearings as we learn of them. Also included in the omnibus bill is the Transportation Choices Act, which would set a statewide GHG uh, um, target for the transportation sector and details several steps MPOs and IDOT would need to take to ensure that the regional transportation plan and the TIP is in compliance with these targets. As you know, we have a lot of work underway right now that will help us accelerate emissions reductions from the transportation sector between CCAP development and the C2C uh, scenario planning effort. We agree that more tools are needed to reduce emissions from transportation and will provide and we, we will, will be providing more specific feedback to ensure that the implementation levers included are appropriately aligned with our federal requirements as an MPO. Uh, we continue to, to uh, track legislation before the General Assembly uh, that impacts the region and is relevant to CMAP's work. CMAP's IGA staff has included a list of legislation we're tracking in the legislative update that may be of interest to you and the, uh, to you, the CMAP board. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Hey, John, thanks. I You've been in touch with you multiple times down Springfield. We I appreciated your steadfastness in trying to uh, uh, get the, especially the, the financial bill passed in, unfortunately, but I, I think as we talked, we're going to start earlier next year and try to get that on the agenda uh, in January, February, in the minds anyway, and possibly uh, an interest uh, from the governor. We've already begun that. We've started as soon as the legislature adjourned. 
Uh, we have a request for meetings out right now with key members of the appropriate the appropriation staffs of both chambers and the, excuse me and the governor's office as you know he's, you submitted that letter to the governor's office asking for a face-to-face -face on this issue uh, you know it's an incremental process we've, i think we've received more recognition this year than we did last year um, it, but there were a lot of budget pressures that we couldn't respond to and, and it's, it's a matter of priorities for the state but we, we're trying to raise that visibility and the priority of this issue for the governor and for the general assembly Okay. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, Leanne, too, um, given all the budget pressures there are, is it, um, do you see a bright, brighter light now of some recognition that I, I know they're moving money around, but at least they are trying to better fund transportation? Do you, you see that as a positive, uh, something we can cling to that they're getting the message? I would say at the leadership level, there on the just on I'll just speak on the transit side. At the leadership level, there is a strong understanding of what the fiscal challenges are, and a commitment to wanting to help solve them. I think there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of education across rank and file members in the General Assembly. I mean, I've been sadly been around long enough to remember the 08 reform legislation and I think you could account there's only six members in the General Assembly that were around at that time so lack of um, sort of knowledge and history I think is sort of one of the things that we're doing so similarly to sort of what John was saying and Aaron was saying around just general conversations about all these challenges we face in our region we're also meeting with both legislators and others around the region over the summer months and we'll carry that into sort of the fall should anything happen in lame duck, if I was a betting person, I'd say not likely, but could. So we're sort of continuing that education and understanding across membership. So, yeah, I'd agree. I don't expect many lame ducks after the November election. The way the maps have been drawn and the way the, the success rate of of, of incumbents has, has, has grown, uh, there's not really the lame duck session like there used to be. I do think that the awareness among the General Assembly members and leadership and the governor's office. Has, uh, has increased on this issue. And I think that the legislation that's been proposed, various bills that have been proposed that I just talked about and the part report has, and the fiscal cliff that we hear so much about has made them focus, will make them focus more specifically on this issue as we get forward into the next uh, General Assembly. John, thanks again for your work done there. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mayor. Yeah. Uh, John, just a, a quick question in regards to the neighborhood concert tax. Was there any discussion on why local parks and recs department were excluded from that ability? Because many parks and rec department do the same things as park districts do. So I was just wondering if there was any conversation around that. I've not heard, but I'm happy to get more details from the uh, Park District Association. Okay, thank you. I'll, get, I'll follow up with, with you on that. Appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Moving on to uh, other business. None being under public comment. Is anybody on uh, public comment in the audience? If not on uh, Zoom? None being. Hold on one second. Gar Garland is here. Hi, Garland. Hey, I'm Mayor Bennett and everybody in the Chicagoland area. How you doing? It's Garland Armstrong from Des Moines, Iowa. How's everybody doing? Good, Garland. How are you? All right. I would like to um, add a little something about the climate part, of, especially for people with disabilities, and they need to be educated about it. And especially when, like when they extreme hot weather, especially when it's 75 and up, some of them have extreme asthma. Like for example, my wife has it and others in the Chicagoland area. Are y'all working on, y'all working to educate people with disabilities who have like extreme asthma needs to understand about climate change, especially when seasonal weather changes because sometimes they really don't have, they really don't understand it. And I think some of the, some of them in the disability community needs to understand about weather changes because sometimes god forbid some of them could die instantly like coming up next like we got june coming up going into july especially with the disability pride parade and it's going to be extreme hot weather i hope they need to be well prepared for this because sometimes there is there was no communication with it and no transparency and no translation about what about climate changes so i think they need to really need a lot of help on that so is anybody there will be able to help them understand about it, what I said, and making sure for our public transit, make sure to have it good, like air conditioning on the train, on the trains and the buses, because sometimes 
when it gets like 90 something and and above, I hope it'll be completely air conditioned and making sure that we won't have any incidents like when people died of breathing problems and other things when they take public transit. So I just would like to make sure, are they, are y'all going to be well prepared for this, especially with the first day of summer coming up um, this month and going into, going into September. So is there anybody um, who can help out with them and make sure that they be extremely well prepared for this? And I'll be glad, I'll be glad to answer any questions from y'all if you have any suggestions or something. Thanks, Gerland. We can share your concerns with folks who um, may be at the city who are already pre-planning for some of the extreme heat uh, preparedness work. Um, I'll just say on the climate action planning part, uh, we are particularly focused on vulnerable communities and communities with high instances of asthma, which in, would include sort of disability communities as well, because we know that that's uh, a, a key focus um, of us thinking about how we make sure that, that the air is cleaner here in the region. So uh, more to come on that, Garland. All right. With, uh, again, we will not meet till September. We'll get a break over the summer. With that in mind, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Yeah. Moved and second. All in favor, signify in usual manner. Aye. Most security meeting adjourned. Thank you all. Enjoy your summer. And for those in the executive committee, it's going to be quick. So please come to the next room. Thank you. And those online. <laughs>